Uh, my name is Victor Kasten. I'm here to talk about Sanctum. And this work was done at MIT's Computer Science and AI Lab together with Ilya Lebedev, who's in the room, and Professor Shrini Devadas, who is not here today. So Sanctum's goal is trusted computing. In this respect, our work belongs to the same family as TPM, TXT, SGX, and TrustZone. However, Sanctum gives you unprecedented protection and unprecedented control over your own computer. Uh, most of Sanctum security logic is in software. So this isn't firmware, it's not hardware, it's not microcode, it's pure software. So you can analyze it, you can see what it does, and uh, you can decide if it uh, meets your goals. This is an unprecedented level of control. Most trusted computing solutions uh, live in some opaque hardware that you can't touch and you can't inspect. Uh, we also have unprecedented protection because uh, we protect against all known practical software attacks and this includes especially cache timing attacks and none of the solutions that I mentioned before cover cache timing attacks. And uh, last, this is practical, I'm going to end the talk with uh, some performance results that show that despite the fact that uh, previous work said protecting against cache timing attacks is not practical because the overheads would be too large Actually, the overheads are pretty reasonable and you can implement this and stop worrying today. So first I'm going to start with an overview of trusted computing. So there's this dream called remote computation in which you can take your code and your data, bundle it up, send it to a remote computer that you don't control and it's going to execute there and you're going to get your results back and everything is good and safe thanks to magic. This is a dream, we don't have such magic. Fully homomorphic encryption is as close as we get to such magic. But if you're willing to trust a piece of hardware, we have trusted computing, which gives you roughly the same scenario, except now you have to trust a piece of software and you have to know that you're talking to that trusted piece of, sorry, piece of hardware. And you have to know that you're talking to that trusted piece of hardware when you're sending it your code and your data. This trust comes from software at the station. And very briefly, the idea behind software attestation is that there's a manufacturer that you trust. This manufacturer behaves as a certificate authority. And whenever it creates a piece of trusted hardware, that piece of trusted hardware gets an attestation key. And the manufacturer gives it an endorsement certificate that says this attestation key belongs to a piece of trusted hardware. Now, when you're going to send your code and data to that trusted hardware, it's going to create a secure container for you to get your code and data in. And you're going to send that uh, secure container a challenge message. And that secure container is going to create a response to your challenge message. And it's going to ask the hardware to sign this response. And when you look at the signature, you're going to see that the response was produced by a container. You're going to know exactly what was in the container when that response was produced and you're going to see all the certificates that say this is trusted hardware and that container is hosted by trusted hardware. All right, this works for every piece of trusted computing. If you're presenting something else, feel free to steal the slides. Uh, now, what systems, what trusted computing systems have that makes them different is they put different amounts of software in this secure container. Uh, for example, TPM puts an entire operating system and all the applications inside. Uh, whereas something like SGX only puts the user application in the secure container. They also differ in how the container interacts with the rest of the environment. What the trusted hardware is that makes this container secure. And what uh, software you need in order to make this container secure. And last, the software attestation process itself differs between systems. And hopefully through the rest of this talk, I'm going to uh, be able to tell you where Sanctum lies on all these aspects. So let's start by going over Sanctum software stack very quickly. Uh, we'll start all the way at the bottom. Our secure containers are called enclaves. This is exactly like in SGX. Uh, so our secure containers only have the user application. They don't require an operating system. They don't require a, hyper a hypervisor, no system software there. Uh, our enclaves run at the lowest possible privilege level. This is user level on most architectures or ring three if you're on Intel. And this means that they cannot compromise the operating system or any other system software. 
So we don't need to worry about what happens if malicious software enters in an enclave. It's going to be managed just like any other malicious process. The OS can shut it down and can prevent uh, the resources it can access. Uh, enclaves can access the memory space of their host applications, so they can do efficient, fast communication with their host application, but they cannot communicate with the OS directly. This is because when you perform a syscall, you trust the operating system to set the execution context when it returns from the syscall. And we can't trust the operating system because it's not part of the secure container. So instead, enclaves have to rely on their host application to uh, perform syscalls. So there's some proxying whenever you want to do a syscall from the enclave. Fortunately, if you're writing software for an enclave, you don't need to care about this your runtime should be able to handle all of this for you. For example, if you're linked against libc, whenever libc wants to make a system call, it would talk to the host application and proxy the system call through the host application all the way to the operating system. Uh, the, uh, so that was enclaves. Uh, now what we introduce our software is uh, going to be two pieces of software and they are software. They're not firmware, they're not microcode, uh, they are not in hardware. So this means they're not isolated from anything else on the computer. So we need a new privilege level for our software to run in. Fortunately, uh, our prototype targets the RISC V architecture, which just happens to have a machine level that does exactly what we want. So on our prototype, we are targeting uh, the machine level of the RISC V architecture. In general, you need a new privilege level to keep your uh, security software isolated. So this is the machine level. Uh, the main piece of software that we are adding is called a security monitor. And the security monitor is tiny so that it can be formally verified. We didn't formally verify it, but it is well within the scope of what formal verification can cover. And the way to keep it tiny is we don't let it make any uh, resource allocation decisions. Instead, these decisions stay with the operating system where they belong. And the operating system simply tells the security monitor, these are my decisions, commit them to hardware. And the security monitor keeps track of these decisions and makes sure that the decisions comply with Sanctum security policy. And if any decision does not match the security policy, then uh, that decision is uh, rejected by the security monitor. Uh, this is equivalent to SGX's instructions that fail if you try to do something that would be insecure. Except in our case, everything is implemented in software. Uh, the other piece of software is a measurement route. And this code runs at boot time and the, it sets up the software attestation chain. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that soon. But after the boot process, this measurement route goes away, and the only thing that runs is the security monitor. So we have all this software that we rely on, but at the same time, we let the user replace most of it. And this is why we say we give you unprecedented control. Let me talk a little bit about Sanctum's uh, software attestation process and how we can give you security and at the same time let the computer owner replace the security software. Uh, before we talk about the attestation scheme itself, I'm going to talk about the boot process because w this is where the attestation chain gets established. So our security monitor is the part that can be replaced by the user and this implements all of Sanctum security policies. So if you don't like our policies, you can take advantage of our hardware and fork the system and build your own. And if other people are willing to trust you, good for you, you have a trusted uh, computing system. So in order to keep things secure, we have to rely on the measurement root code. And this is not user replaceable. This is burned into a processor ROM. And this is responsible for reading the security monitor and for hashing it and measuring it. So the measurement root reads the security monitor and hashes it. And uh, after the security monitor is hashed, this is fed into a bit of cryptographic machinery, and this machinery produces an RSA key pair. And the RSA key pair is going to become the security monitor's uh, RSA key pair. 
the measurement root uh, has access to the processors at the station key and it uses that to sign the key that he just generated for the security monitor. So a security monitor will have its own attestation key and it will have a certificate that will say this was the security monitor, this was its hash, and its key is guaranteed to be a proper attestation key for that security monitor. So if you're willing to trust the security monitor's code, you can believe that attestations signed by that key are legit attestations. Uh, finally, in case you're horrified by the idea of having to generate an RSA key on every boot, we have a caching mechanism that I'm not going to go into detail here that lets us uh, securely cache the RSA key and the certificate for the security monitor across boot cycles in non-volatile memory. So as long as the user doesn't replace the security monitor, we can use the cached RSA key and skip the key generation step at boot time. So I guess as long as you don't replace your monitor all the time, your boots are going to be fast. Now before I show you the attestation scheme itself, last thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is uh, how we build enclaves. And this is very similar to SGX. When an enclave is created, it starts out in a loading mode. And in that mode, the application that wants the enclave talks to the operating system, which talks to the security monitor, and it loads code and data into the enclave. Everything that is loaded into the enclave is measured and contributes to the enclave's identity. Once loading is completed, uh, the enclave is initialized, and at this point, the enclave's measurement is finalized. So you can't load things into the enclave anymore, but you can start executing the enclave. So basically, the enclave's measurement is the initial state of its memory and it covers everything that was loaded into it by the operating system. And this measurement is what will show up in software attestation. All right, the rest of software attestation is really pretty straightforward. I'm going to go through it very quickly, just so you can see all the ideas come together. So, whoa, what was that? <laughs> so assuming you trust a manufacturer, you're trusting a root key. The manufacturer builds a Sanctum processor and gives it its own uh, public-private key pair together with a certificate. When the processor boots up, the, uh, the measurement code will measure the security monitor and it will give it its attestation key together with an attestation certificate. When you want to create an enclave uh, on a remote computer that you don't trust, you're going to have that computer create the enclave and you're going to send it a challenge message. The enclave will start executing and will produce a response message and it will ask the outside to give it an attestation signature. Uh, one little thing that we have different from every, from I guess the older systems and that matches SGX is that our signing happens in a signing enclave. So this is just like every other enclave in the sense that it's an enclave and it receives all the protection guarantees that enclaves receive. But it's a special enclave that has a special measurement. And when Sanctum, when the, the Sanctum security monitor sees this measurement, it will release uh, its private attestation key to the enclave. So all the cryptographic operations happen in a signing enclave and not in the security monitor itself. And this is just because enclaves are more isolated than the security monitor. And we're going to go into that a little bit later. So in order to get a signature, you're going to have to spin up the signing enclave. Uh, you're going to have to use Sanctum's uh, inter-enclave communication mechanisms to talk to it and send it the response message that needs to be signed. And then the signing enclave will produce an attestation signature that includes the original enclave's measurement together with uh, the response message that was signed. And after you see all the chain of certificates and the attestation signature, you will be convinced that you're talking to the enclave that you want to talk to. So an enclave that was initialized according to your instructions that's running on uh, trusted Sanctum hardware together with a security monitor that you trust because you've seen all the chain that covers everything. So this is how we give you control while at the same time giving you a 
secure attestation scheme. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about protection. So I claim we give you unprecedented protection because we protect against all software attacks, including cache timing attacks. And first of all, I'm going to mention that we're targeting multi-core processors with a shared last level cache. And this is because private caches are, per core caches are super easy to protect. When you enter an enclave, you flush the per core cache. When you exit an enclave, you flush the per core cache and you've removed any cache sharing. This strategy is easy uh, to reason about. It's simple and we like simple, so we use it. But at the same time, it doesn't work for the more interesting case, which is when you have one big last level cache that all the cores uh, share. And that strategy doesn't work because you're, an attacker could be accessing the cache at the same time as your enclave. So you need a, more, a slightly more complicated strategy. And the slightly more complicated strategy that we use to kill the suspense is the cache coloring. I'll summarize it in a bit. It's really the simplest strategy that works. And the main point isn't that it's the best strategy, but even with a simple strategy, we get reasonable overheads. So this is practical and we can start doing it today to get proper protection against software attacks. Uh, before I go into it, uh, we almost scaled to a full Intel desktop system. The only thing that trips us is hyperthreading. We don't handle hyperthreading because uh, when you have hyperthreading on, two logical processors that are in the same core share so much microarchitectural state that we can think of a sane way to protect against timing attacks in that scenario. So no hyperthreading for Sanctum. Other than that, we could scale to a full-blown desktop processor. Very quickly, what's the problem with cache timing attacks? What are they? What, uh, how do we defend against them? So cache timing attacks take advantage of a fact that a cache hit is much faster than a cache miss. And in Sanctum, we're targeting uh, set associative caches. And the nice thing about set associative caches is that each set effectively acts as its own independent cache. So the physical address of the memory location that is cached decides which set the location will get cached in. And two locations that get cached in different sets have absolutely no interaction in the cache. So what we want to do is partition in order to defeat uh, cache timing attacks. And the idea behind partitioning is that if we can get all the memory that's private to our enclave to occupy sets that are guaranteed to not be occupied by any attacker, there's not going to be any attack because there's no more shared cache. So there's no more cache timing attack. And the nice thing about caches is that they use physical addresses. And physical addresses are completely decoupled from what software uses. Software goes through address translation, which uses virtual addresses. So if we look at uh, a physical address, most of its bits are determined by address translation, not by what the software uh, originally used in its virtual address. And if we look at the address bits that uh, are controlled by address translation and we overlap them with the address bits that uh, are used to compute the cache set index, we find some bits that are controlled by the page tables and that control cache placement. And we call these bits our DRAM region index and other people call them the page color. So in page coloring schemes, these are called the page color. Uh, these bits have the property that if two addresses have different values for these bits, they're going to end up in different cache sets and they're never going to interfere in the cache. And uh, they're fully controlled by the page tables. So given that in Sanctum we have the highest level of uh, software running on the machine, we can say you're going to set up your page tables to, uh, to match a certain security policy. So you're going to set up your page table in such a way that enclaves are going to occupy memory that doesn't overlap in the cache with non-enclave software. And if you use cache partitioning, uh, sorry, uh, page coloring blindly, you end up with page colors like you see on the left. Basically, uh, if you uh, color DRAM, every page has a different color. We do a nice little trick in hardware so that 
our page colors look like this in DRAM. And this has the nice property that if the OS only has uh, some uh, DRAM regions, it can still allocate a large buffer of continuous memory. And you want large buffers of continuous memory in order to talk to devices such as a graphics card or a NIC that want to have a large DMA buffer that you interact with. All right, and as I was alluding to, uh, once we have the setup where DRAM is split up into DRAM regions, uh, we're going to allocate DRAM regions to either enclaves or to non-enclave software. And each enclave has its own page tables, and its page tables map uh, virtual address space to the enclave's uh, DRAM regions. And then all the virtual address space that is outside the special range maps into the enclave's host uh, application space. So this is how an enclave talks to its host application. It can just read and write its memory. But the converse is not true. No application can read and write into enclave memory. All right, these are the high level details. The more exciting uh, small details are in the paper, so I hope you will read it. And before I wrap up, I want to show you some performance numbers to convince you that this is practical. So we have cache partitioning going, which prevents against the cache timing attacks. Uh, we have separate page tables for enclaves and for non-enclave software, which prevents against attacks that take advantage of uh, how bits are set in the page tables. And enclave memory is isolated from non-enclave memory. So we have full isolation, and we still get good performance numbers. So we, perform, we did a performance analysis on a Rocket Core, which uh, is an implementation of the RISC-V architecture that's open source, produced at Berkeley. And the Rocket Core has the nice property that it's in order, so we can just measure each overhead and add them up. And it has a nice property that there is a cycle accurate rocket uh, simulator. So we combined this with a cache simulator and we ran all the spec int tests that didn't require too much operating system support. And these are the main results. The paper has more detailed results, but uh, the main results are that for most tests, we have small overheads, and the largest overhead we've seen is 18% for bzip2, and then MCF is the next worst. And these are known tests that perform poorly if your cache gets smaller, which is exactly what's happening with Sanctum. And I'll stop here and take questions. Jian Zhang, Microsoft Research. Great work. Um, so I take it that in your system, um, so the keys, the secret, the keys that you use to encrypt data and so on, these are uh, derived from the hash of the uh, security monitor, right? That's how you kind of bootstrap the everything. Is that correct? Yes. Right. You're referring okay. to the software attestations. Right. right. So if yes. that's the case, then let's say that you know somehow I, I need to update my security monitor because there's some problem. How, what's your recommendation for sort of recovering those uh, keys and maybe for update in, in this kind of update process? Do you, does it make sense? So I had, let's say I've, so I, I, I had running, I had run some programs in my enclave, there's some secrets there, right? And then now I need to mo update my security monitor. And then, you know, then the next time I boot up, you know, all the keys that need to be used for decrypt those secrets. These yes, are we, right? uh, we recommend that you store your secrets on the same remote system that you use to uh, authenticate the enclave when you do software attestation. So you recommend some kind of remote yes. backup and restore? So in order to allow multiple security monitors, right. we don't have any sort of migration happening because we don't have any way to have a relationship between security monitors. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the advantage of having multiple separate monitors is that you could have your monitor trust a public key. So we have our reference implementation of a security monitor, but you could have your own monitor, you could have it trust a public key, and encrypt all that data under that public key okay. somewhere, and then somehow have another system feed data into the new monitor. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you for the question. Hi, uh, this is just a quick clarification question. So for the cache coloring scheme, are you using a static partitioning or is this changed based on the program's usage of memory? 
That's a great question. Thank you very much. So the question was, is the cache partitioning scheme static? Uh, there is a static component in the sense that memory is statically assigned, uh, statically split up into DRAM regions, but the operating system gets to uh, assign these DRAM regions either to itself and its untrusted applications or to various enclaves. And this assignment changes uh, at runtime to adapt to various workloads. Okay, all right, thanks. It's Eric Fournay, Microsoft Research. So I have a related question. So how do you enforce the page coloring and uh, to what extent is it covered by remote attestation? Uh, so the first question was how do we enforce the page coloring yes. and the second question? Uh, whether it is uh, covered by remote attestations or just controlled by the operating system. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I can't hear very Whether well. the remote attestation uh, is good enough to cover, to check that uh, page coloring was enforced on the machine. So uh, remote attestation is completely separate from page coloring. And basically, if you trust the security monitor to do page coloring correctly and to enforce it, then you can trust the remote attestation's result. But the first question is very interesting. How do you enforce page uh, coloring? So uh, let me see if I have this right here. So this is what that looks like from a software perspective. There are some hardware registers that the security monitor gets to configure. And basically, these registers say uh, if you're running in enclave mode or if you're not running in enclave mode, they identify the two page tables, the enclave's page tables and then the operating system's page tables. They say which virtual memory address range maps to the enclave page tables. And then there are two bitmaps of DRAM regions. And there's a bitmap for OS-owned DRAM regions, and there is a bitmap for Enclave-owned DRAM regions. Mm -hmm. And the security monitor is responsible for keeping track of which regions belong to whom and for setting these registers. And then these registers feed into our uh, hardware modifications to the page mishandler. And our modifications don't change the core of the page mishandler. We don't touch the finite state machine there. We just modify the inputs, and then we modify, uh, so we filter the results of the DRAM reads that the PMH issues. So this looks, this sounds really bad, but actually the circuits are super simple. So this is one circuit, and this is the other circuit. And the fact that they fit on slides is pretty good news to me. Um, okay, is thanks. it in the paper? Yes. Okay. okay All thanks. the figures are in the paper. Okay, All right. Thank thanks. you very much. Thank you.